All right, welcome back. In case you're just joining us, safety and security is a conversation we're having today, even as we open or rather mark the reopening of the Ducey D2 building, that Bangkok High End hotel that we saw that was attacked earlier on this year around January. 196 days later, they say that they are rising from the ashes. So, Dr. Muko, very quickly, you wanted to comment on also what um, the lady that Trevor Mbija was interviewing earlier. But even as you comment on that, perhaps you could also talk to me about the role, and especially in this day and age, where here in Kenya, we talk we sing about devolution how what can we do at the grassroots level what can we do county to county so that way there's a bit more of integration when it comes to fighting um, terrorism in Kenya thank you very much in 2016 the uh, National Counterterrorism Center and the, uh, the Kenya at large came up with a, a national strategy on countering uh, violent extremism and uh, this strategy uh, has been devolved into county action plans. Mm -hmm. this, these county action plans started in the hotspot counties, Mombasa, Kwale, and they were participatory in nature, whereby key stakeholders and county uh, uh, and intelligence security committees would sit, explore, the, the, uh, investigate the hotspots, investigate the enablers, investigate the drivers and motivators of radicalization and recruitment, and come up with a plan. And these plans are based on a number of pillars, uh, some of them economic pillar, education pillar, political pillar, ideological pillar, because it is in ideology where people are, uh, their minds are reconstructed mm -hmm. or, or deconstructed to think otherwise. Uh, psychological pillars, because as you heard Kemunto say, they, were, they went through intense counseling. Again, the intense counseling is to reconstruct the mind back to a resilient mode whereby you can resist and you are courageous enough to deal with terrorism. Now, the county action plans uh, um, um, devolved uh, uh, actions whereby communities have identified their own uh, methods, one, to prevent radicalization at the lowest level, to prevent uh, recruitment, identify those at the grassroots that act as, that act as in uh, either recruitment or those who can be used to deliver messages and at the grassroots, the media is involved because uh, other than print media and these uh, electronic media, you know one of the biggest uh, drivers of uh, uh, violent extremism is social media, hmm. whereby they can tweet messages, they, have, they can train someone, they can radicalize someone through media, hmm. constant communication, and someone is taken through a series of learning. So the county action plans uh, has built a number of, uh, one of the outcomes mm -hmm. is to get what we call uh, uh, counter-terrorism champions. So we have 47 counties. If we have about 500 people who are trained, who are champions in counter-terrorism, then we have a quarter million people in Kenya who are on a daily basis. That's a big army right. countering violent extremism. And, and speaking of countering violent extremism and uh, the issue of radicalization. Tabitha, let me rope you in. How do we handle the issue of the recruitment of young people that we are seeing mm -hmm. into these um, crime groups? Uh, first, we need to understand why young people are being drawn into these groups mm -hmm. uh, and then address those issues. If it is an issue to do with their economic status, what can we do to keep them busy, for instance, so that they have a uh, means of becoming self-reliant? Uh, we also need to look at what methods are being used to get to these young people? Is it social media? So how can we use social media for good? So for instance, um, there were a lot of extremist people that were using YouTube, for instance, to have their sermons, to have their teachings, to give speeches. And so young people would look at these and get drawn to that. And so YouTube now has a policy where if your content has certain red flags that are related to violent extremism, then it's taken down. So uh, once we understand what methods are being used to get these young people, we also need to get ways of collecting intelligence on these groups. Do we use some people as insiders to get us information? And once we get that information, then we start the process of bringing these people to justice. And for me, I think the sentencing of the people responsible for the Garissa attack was a big win for the country because it showed that as a country, we will not let those people that take advantage of security 
loopholes here and there to kill people get away with it. So mm. it's very important that we continue seeing this prosecution and eventually successful sentencing of these people so that they, are, they also act as a deterrence to other people. Right. As a deterrent to others. Okay, so we have uh, some, some of your feedback and of course you can keep talking to us. Hashtag Daybreak. And the SMS line is 22422. Let's put up those tweets now. All oh, right, Simiu Hastings says, it is encouraging to see Dusi D2 reopening. It means we won't be cowed by terrorists who want to distract investors and nations amongst Kenyans. Let's all be vigilant and especially our security agencies. Know your neighbor and know your business partner. Very interesting there. Still sticking on Twitter. Remember the hashtag to use is Daybreak. Francis, good morning. You say Kenyans must just love their country and look out for each other. Be alert to what is going on around them and alert to the authorities when they suspicious, um, suspicion rather. Trust between the government and its people needs to improve so that information can be shared. Our media must be positive. <laughs> and, and, and just picking it up from there, looking out for each other and the cost that also terrorism brings into our country's economy. I remember reading a, um, a study that showed that the 9-11 attack costed America $2 trillion. US mm, dollars. It's yeah. too many zeros for me to even convert it into Kenyan shillings. Yeah, shilling. it's two trillion. <laughs> two trillion US dollars. Yes. And that was the economic damage. Mm -hmm. You have not even the, talked the about the infrastructure. There you go. What have you. <laughs> because like a lot of people, oh, I'm sorry to okay, interrupt. Okay. After this attack happened, a lot of people who had booked flights, for instance, decided they were not going to fly mm -hmm. because they were thinking, what if something like this happens? So things such as that. So people cancelled business meetings, people were supposed to travel and see their family and do right. things. All this was interrupted. People were now scared of leaving their homes. That also prevents people from sp uh, spending money and money getting into the into the system. So it, it has a lot of negative implications. And for me, I always have an issue with all these advisories because when an attack happens in Kenya, just like you mentioned, they all want to say, oh, Kenya is not safe for you to travel. But when an attack happens there, they want to show how they're standing with those people. Mm. And my biggest critique of these advisories is if you're giving it from an outsider perspective, how much information do you have about Kenya that maybe you have not shared with our law enforcement? Right. So I think uh, there was a uh, passing by the UN some years back to make sure that when these advisories are being passed, one, they're not biased and they help people become more secure and more aware of their surroundings the as opposed to wait, being wait scared this of matter. it. Mm -hmm. The UN actually pronounced themselves on this? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. That was when they were passing, um, they, they were coming up with best practices on how to deal with kidnapping for ransom. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And, and you wanted to come in as well, Dr. Harry? Yes, because uh, one of the ultimate uh, uh, intentions of the terrorists is to hurt the economy mm -hmm. of a region, a country, or a people. In uh, Western uh, Africa, uh, the Boko Haram have flattened cities, towns, completely mm -hmm. decimated. Uh, the economic. Yes, 52% of the region, in, uh, the region is occupied, that is occupied by Boko Haram. People are displaced, there are no buildings, and so that they cut off the structured uh, national security and safety apparatus mm -hmm. from, the people. from the people. So, so Dr. Morgan Tabitha, even as we are having this conversation of the economy and what tourism does to our country in terms of its biashara and so mm -hmm. forth. Mm -hmm. I can't help but question mm -hmm. the issue of xenophobia, the mm -hmm. issue of skepticism when it comes to foreign cultures, mm -hmm. when it comes to businessmen and women, especially now that we are singing, mm -hmm. open your borders mm -hmm. for biashara mm -hmm. amongst ourselves as Africans. Mm -hmm. Xenophobia when it comes to immigrants, xenophobia mm -hmm. when it comes to refugees. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How will terrorism add to this? Or what can we do even to make sure that as much as we are fighting terrorism, we're keeping xenophobia away. Mm -hmm. Xenophobia, yeah, it's one, is psychological. You are better off with someone you know. When you're doing business, you'd feel safe with someone you know. Uh, but when we open up the borders and other people come in with new technology, new marketing system, new products, it's a plus for everybody on both sides. Mm -hmm. But now, the issue of jobs in South Africa, one of the problems that brought up xenophobia was lack of jobs for the locals. Why didn't they have jobs? Their level of education is low. Kenya mm -hmm. is an industry in terms of human resource capital. Mm -hmm. And uh, our capital is in excess in most areas. If you travel, you, I mean, uh, Waihiga, and you leave this uh, station today, most likely there's somebody waiting at the door <laughs> to join in. Mm -hmm. But in South Africa, they don't have locals. Not in one, there are many. There are many people out there yes. you know, looking for so jobs. So we have to occupy our human capital. One of the biggest uh, drivers of uh, 
terrorism and violent extremism uh, in radicalization and recruitment is the massive unemployment. And the massive unemployment is something we have to deal with. It's very hard. But among the economic drivers, we have to identify actions that will enable the young people to have something in their pocket mm -hmm. so that they are not uh, uh, motivated to either move to South Africa or other countries. They can work in their country and be economically... Uh, they can be economically empowered. The empowered. funny thing is, when you look at the influx of immigrants and refugees, Uganda has received a far larger number of refugees mm -hmm. than Kenya has, mm -hmm. with fewer attacks. What I would say is there was a question that was asked and my re by Zinzi, and my response would be awareness. Let's make people aware of the people in our society. So for instance, we have uh, a lot of people who've been living in Kenya as refugees. Uh, what is their history? What, what, what is their culture? Like, let's get to know about them from them and they also get to learn from us so that we don't have to keep being suspicious of each other. And when we are aware of maybe their history and the things we have in common with them, then we will find that they're adding value to our country. So I think we have to keep people like these refugees busy in Kenya so that they're able to get decent work, uh, access to opportunities like education and even jobs. Of course, when you mention jobs, there's a lot of people in Kenya who don't have jobs, but then what we need to do as a country is start looking at the future. Think of, these are the skills that will be needed 10 years from now, maybe because of things like um, advancement of technology. So do we now continue training people, say, on business administration, or do we now start helping these people get skills that will be useful for the future? So I think we need to be flexible in terms of our education system, uh, the way we restructure jobs, the way we do business, and that way we will be able to deal with some of these issues. And, and speaking of, oh, about Uganda, just picking it up from what Wahiga asked, um, do mm -hmm. you, would you believe that Kenya suffers more because she shares the burdens of other countries more, e.g. the number of immigrants we take in, mm -hmm. the number of refugees we take in as a country? Mm -hmm. um, you gave the example of our position, our physical position, mm -hmm. being closer to Somalia. So would you say that Kenya suffers more because mm -hmm. she takes on more as well? Uh, but wouldn't any well, country say that? <laughs> <laughs> I will say yes and no. Okay. No, because our infrastructure is really good. We have good banking systems, good communication systems. So it's easier for you to plan an attack from within Kenya than it is, say, from Uganda. Kenya being an economic powerhouse, there's more places for you to attack. So if you're planning on attacking a certain hotel, for instance, and then you find out that the law enforcement have intel on that, then you can always shift. But then if you think of some of these countries in the region, if you don't maybe attack, say, the most famous university in the country, where else do you attack? If you think of their hotels, are they up to standard with ours? I'm not saying that we're so good that we have to be attacked all the time, but when tourists are looking for who to attack, the higher, the bigger the target, the better it is for them. Because like he mentioned, it's all about media and publicity and how they put it out there. Okay, so I'll, 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 I'll interrupt both of you uh, <laughs> because we just want to quickly cross over and, and get another one from Trevor and then Dr. Ray, I'll come back to you. There's been a proposal to arm security guards. I'd like to get your thoughts on that. Uh, but Trevor, uh, back to you and uh, just let us know who you're speaking with uh, at this time. Well, thanks, Higgs. We're still trying to sample the area. It's been transformed significantly after six months. It's the last complex to open around the 14 Riverside area. And now joining me here, he's coming for breakfast, by the way, just we got him in between, is Maurice Otieno, the GM for Meta. They're just housed a few blocks from here. Thanks for making time for us, Maurice. So the Meta was shut down for almost a month yes. after the attack. Yes. During that time, what was going through your mind? I mean, um, during the attack, we happened to lose one of our colleagues and business partner. Uh, that's Jason Spindler. Uh, may his soul rest in peace. Um, so when we closed, we got a lot of offers to just move and, and, and be in other spaces around the country, actually. So we got a lot of people asking us to go to Kisumu, Nakuru, even some people offering their houses as a place where we could go and work from. And uh, that support was so overwhelming during that period that when we came back, we knew that we were scared, of course, because of business uh, and what had transpired here. But uh, when we came back, uh, we managed, after a month, we managed to host our first event 
and uh, with that sort of like mindset where we are still scared of what's next we got um 70 people coming for the first event i think for us that changed our mindset in terms of the pre uh, the, the post where we had a lot of support and during even when we were recovering and we still had support from people coming through for uh, for the event and uh, that signified a lot of resilience for us so all this time when people are offering you office spaces all this was for free because they knew you were affected and this is just Kenyans coming to your support and to your aid yeah, yeah all this was for free all this was for free we managed to stay at um, FSD Kenya uh, just down the road and Twiga offices where we stayed for free for a whole month uh, without paying them anything. Um, actually, the funny thing is that on the last day they threw a party for us and just said, hey, uh, thank you so much for going back and showing resilience. Uh, and that gives us a, gave us a lot of motivation to just keep on doing what you're doing and being at this space. Yeah. This is the last complex to open around here after the attack. What have you learned in terms of the security measures, even for Meta, which is just a few blocks from here? I think uh, sometime back I laughed when somebody said security starts with you. I think it starts with us and, and, and the thing is you can never know when this thing will happen so you just need to be prepared. On that particular day we had about 50, 45 to 50 people in the, in the room and the chaos that went in was crazy but the funny thing is that now we sit back and look back and say sometimes laugh about it uh, and see how the craziness went on uh, i think sometimes you just need to get prepared one but also just learn how to get out of that situation mentally very fast uh, and that has really made our team to recover so fast uh, that is impeccable for us um yeah speaking of mental strength how has this impacted on the unity within the people themselves are there those who are still a bit shaken are the people more united now how has it been for the people in in meta honestly i think now it has gotten us to deeply care about each other deeply deeply care about each other in a way that we've never seen before uh we we went through this traumatic situation all together the entire team was in the office and we went through a recovery process all together and we saw people in their vulnerable states uh, where they're scared for their lives but again we saw people in their bravery when they are recovering and they are taking the uh, the bull by the horn and now everything is okay i think it has made us to know each other deeply and actually get concerned really about each other yeah during that attack this is one of those attacks that there was a lot of praise for the security forces in terms of the coordinated assistance that they gave to the people you experienced it firsthand how would you rate it was it that good was it well coordinated the way it was portrayed yeah, it was well coordinated because, I mean, some things that I saw were, are just seen in movies. Uh, helicopters landing and people sliding down because we are on the rooftop of, of, we are on the rooftop of uh, Belgravia building so we could see almost all the rooftops. And for us, it was like a movie and we couldn't believe that our forces are that equipped. So, are that equipped and even that trained. So, I think it was very well coordinated. It was uh, very well executed and we thank the forces for the job that they did and we pray for the uh, lost ones um, and may this all rest in peace. Yeah. You're here this morning having breakfast. Why are you here? What, what does that mean for you? Um, um, as uh, I mean for us, Ducit reopening is a big thing for our business. So in any way that we can support Ducit uh, uh, and the Ducit family is a big thing for us. Our business totally depends on foot traffic and it all depends on people having confidence with the security of the place. And Ducit reopening that just indicates that there's a lot of confidence within the space and I, we hope it will bring back business to us, uh, which uh, has been actually tremendous since the attack. We, we never foresaw that. Yeah. Compare the security situation now and what it was back then. Have you seen some improvement even in terms of the area of the 14 Riverside Drive, the entry, the exit, all that? Yeah, there's a lot of improvement. There's a lot of surveillance. Um, there's a lot of improvement from even the, the staff members just being vigilant. So uh, the, it, even the infrastructure that has been put up, it's very, very tight. And I think you feel safe immediately walk into the, into the gate. Um, and yeah, it's just amazing. Yeah. I'll give you a chance for the final message to Kenyans today. In the face of all these terror attacks, Ducit now reopens. It's one of the, the Westgate also reopened some times back. Your final message to Kenyans. Yeah. I think for me, terrorists are called terrorists because they, terror, they terrify us. And the minute they do that and we get terrified, we get scared of moving. And uh, for us to win is just to show that resilience of where we, we are not terrified. We, you'll attack us over and over. We'll stand up 
and dust ourselves and march on. Uh, and I think I just want to urge the country that it's not a one man fix it all type of situation. It's all of us to just be vigilant and uh, and do our part where we just stand up and dust ourselves and move on. Uh, yeah. Very well said. Thank you so much, Morris. So Morris Etienne, GM mentor there. Well, again, Zinzi, we are uh, at daybreak as well. We're just going to take a short break here. When we come back, I'll show you how the outside area looks like. I won't get into the details of the security arrangements that they have, but I'll just give you a general view because that also exposes them as well. But when we, that is right after the break. Stay with Daybreak.